I'm here today with Reverend Ann Cansfield. Ann is the author of a new book titled Be the Brave One, Living Your Spiritual Values Out Loud and Other Life Lessons. Ann was voted the inaugural New York Times New Yorker of the Year and is the first female and openly gay FDNY chaplain. A graduate of Columbia University, Ann followed the Ivy League crowd to Wall Street until 9-11 happened, and she realized she wanted more from life. In addition to her FDNY chaplaincy, she serves as co-pastor of the Greenpoint Reformed Church in Brooklyn, New York, with her wife, Reverend Jennifer All. So, Ann, it's so wonderful to have you here with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Well, it's just great. Uh, you and I had a wonderful conversation, you know, before the interview, and uh, I really was glad that we've connected. Uh, we know so many people in common and so many other, you know, good stories. So thanks so much for that. Um, so first of all, I have to ask, what exactly does it mean to be the New York Times New Yorker of the year? You're like starting off with the, uh, you know, with the biggest question around. <laughs> Because I, I, I tell the story in the book, but in my opinion, it's one of the most hilarious stories that you can possibly have. <laughs> because it, it sounds like really epically amazing, right? It does. Like the New York Times, New Yorker of the year. <laughs> and all it took was like, I think, 80 votes max. But uh, it, was, it, was a, it was an addendum at the very bottom of the, of the morning news roundup. Um, so we're talking like maybe... 0.01% of all readers of the New York Times might have actually read the segment announcing this, you know, uh, vote for the New Yorker of the year. And, and in it, the, the author had, had, had given a couple of, you know, nominations as ideas. So uh, Donald Trump, Lin-Manuel Miranda, the New York Mets, Pizza Rat, <laughs> and and Anne Cansfield. And, and the reason why I was mentioned at all was because the the the, the, the woman who was writing the, the the piece had had just started at the Times when she was assigned to do a, a profile about my being named as a as an FDMY chaplain. So and we all remember like our first article or our, you know the first sermon we preached and whatnot. So she she put me in. And um, and I don't think that 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 you know, Lynn Manuel Miranda um, had any idea that this was happening, and and Pizza Rat's dad like lacks opposable thumbs to be able to you know vote for him, <laughs> but but Anne Cansfield had a bunch of friends and family members who she like immediately texted and emailed and posted and was like, hey, vote for me <laughs> in, this, in this little known obscure made up competition to be the New Yorker <laughs> of the year. And, um, and wouldn't you know that, that, that I finally, you know, having run for student body president in like the sixth grade and the seventh grade and the ninth grade, I finally won. I finally won. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> So, so, and no, and now, you know, it can be written anywhere. <laughs> Everybody will know. I'm like the New Yorker of the year. It's on your resume permanently. <laughs> permanently. Permanently. Just just remember, I was like, I think it was like 80 votes. You also had to had to make a Times profile, which was extra complicated. Like you couldn't just, just like click a radio button to vote. <laughs> and make a profile. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So I know there's lots of good stories, you know, that you can tell us, but another one I want to hear is like, what was it like to be on Wall Street and uh, make a transition away from that into what you're doing now? Well, you know, it's, it, I think it's a, it was a helpful experience. I loved the market. I love business in part because it's really competitive <laughs> and, and you know, right where you stand there. This is not, um, there's no subjectivity to it. You either, you know, make money or lose money, win or lose. I mean, it's great because there's, there's just, there's, there's no, it takes all of the, the gray area out of the, of, of anything. Right. And, uh, and I also real really, world, as we all know, right. I used to be an engineer. <laughs> I like the same thing. Ones and zeros, very black and white. Right. Ones and zeros, know. black and white. That's not really. And I mean, <laughs> some days in church, I just wish I could get a report card from God. Just let me know how am I doing? Please give me the report card. Um, but but in the in the moment when I when I left to go and, and work on Wall Street, I I had no idea what it involved. Um, I, I was actually just told by a friend to like go for an interview, and he he dressed me up in a suit and he gave me a fancy pen and 
and, and like just told me what to say. And I went and I did it and I got the job. Um, and it was an excellent, you know, foray into, into the working world and to get to see what that was like. Um, and, and I think that after I, I was really more of a liberal arts major and history and women's studies, like after, after dealing with these ethereal topics, um, just the ones and the zeros were really good for me for a while. <laughs> and, uh, and, and in the, in the same way, I'm really grateful for that experience because, um, when 9-11 happened, um, I, I happened to be on the phone with a, uh, with, with a company, um, confirming a job interview, um, on wall street. It was one of the rare times that I was actually home, home in Brooklyn, you know, and, um, and a woman said, well, you know, plane just hit the world trade center. Um, uh, it was, it was a moment that whole day being home, not having anybody I knew around, everybody had, al had already left for work, um, of just a lot of time on my hand and feeling incredibly useless. Um, and I, I remember saying like, I've never felt as, as useless as I, as I felt, um, you know, in the, in the week after 9-11 as a stockbroker. Um, and it, when push comes to solve, no one says, oh my gosh, I need a stockbroker <laughs> to go. <laughs> And you need um, firefighters, right? Right. And and so I, you know, on the on the days that are difficult in ministry now, I can I can look back and say there's a there's a reason why I'm not doing that anymore. And it's precisely because I I I want I wanted to uh I wanted to do something that that added meaning to other people's lives. Um so uh, a, a week later I called up a professor who I knew at the seminary. Um it was a seminar where my dad worked. So I, I, I had a certain connection there and, but I didn't, I was just going to like talk about going to seminary. And he said, Oh, you're, you're so lucky. Um, classes were canceled last Tuesday. And so the, you haven't missed a single class. I'll pick you up at 4 PM and, um, and you can start today. And he didn't give me any opportunity to say no. He was just like, I will pick you up at your apartment in park slope and we will drive to class. That's it. Like <laughs> it is done. Wow. Well, good for you. I mean, it's an amazing transition, though, right? I mean, you know, from that type of vocation to you know what you're doing now. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely it was a, it was a, certainly a big change, uh, and and it's one where I'm I'm just incredibly grateful for the chance to to get to go and 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 be a pastor. I mean, every, there's not a day where I where I can ever take it for granted. And, and then I, I will definitely say that, that when I learned about Father Michael Judge, um, who was the fire department chaplain who was killed on 9-11, I was like, wow, they have chaplains in the fire department? That sounds like the most cool job in the universe. Yeah, so tell uh, I'd really like to have that job. Tell us more about that. What is that like? What does that involve? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> so, so the first couple of, you know, probably... 10 years out of, out of seminary, I was basically like roving around looking for anybody who might be able to tell me any information about this mysterious fire department chaplain job. And then one day I met one of the fire department chaplains. He was at, <laughs> at Union Seminary and he was recruiting seminarians to, to help in his ministry. And I was like, oh, so I like instantaneously sucked up to this guy. Like I wanted to <laughs> know everything he had. And, uh, and he was so kind and loving and gracious. And uh, it turned out he was, he's a Franciscan who, um, who actually took up Michael's work right after Michael died. So mm. started right away. Mm. Um, I think that that night, September 11th, he was helping to make death notifications. Wow. Um, and I, I remember coming home after, after meeting him that day at Union and saying to my wife, like, guess what, honey? Like I met one of the real fire department chaplains and I don't think I can ever do that job. Like it's going to take 20 more years at least before I have the spiritual maturity to be able to go and be like that guy. Mm. Like, mm. I think we should just plan, like I'm a small fish in a big pond and I need to, you know, I just need to grow a little bit more in ministry or maybe a lot more before I'm ready to go and, and do that. So a couple of years later, I, um, found out that there was an opening and I, I interviewed and got the job. And not long afterwards, I, I, I saw Chris again and I was like, listen, I just thought like, I don't have the spiritual maturity for this job. And he looked at me and he was like, 
oh, don't sweat it. You're totally fine, Anne. Like, uh, you know, you, you think it requires a huge amount of spiritual maturity? No way. We got this. <laughs> so what is it like, though? What, what is that? What do you do? I mean, what, what kinds of things are you involved in? Well, in some ways, it's definitely the opposite of like a zeros and ones. You know, there's 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 not a, a, a really significant job uh, description. I've I've tried to find one. One of one of my favorite lines is in the in the rules and regulations. There is a section that is dedicated to the chaplain that basically says you're supposed to wear your uniform properly, <laughs> and that's about it. <laughs> that's the number one requirement, right? That's the number one requirement. And I was like, wow, okay. I'll I'll try to make sure I wear my uniform really properly. But um, we get called out and we respond to um, any third alarm or higher fire. Hmm. Um, and and if a, a member of the FDNY is is injured on the job, um, we get called out there. Or um, God forbid, if if someone dies in the line of duty, we'll get called out there. Um, I think that one of my favorite kind of mental exercises to do is to think like, oh, when, when Michael was a chaplain, how did he spend his time? And how does that differ from the way I spend my time um, and, and what's changed within those circumstances? Um, so in the, in the 1990s, he spent a lot of time um, visiting FDMY firefighters in, in the burn unit, um, a huge amount of time. And, uh, and amazingly, with the changes in technology, with the advent of bunker gear, I have not gotten called to the burn unit, hmm. amazingly. Hmm. Um, but instead, I spend a significant amount of time with members who are um, receiving cancer treatments, um, who are dying of cancer, and um, with families after their loved one has died of a, of a cancer, um, the vast majority related to World Trade Center wow. um, service. Wow. So, so you're right in the thick um, of that. So right in the thick of it. And hmm. uh, um, you know, w w one day, maybe a year into the job, I came home kind of pissy, for lack of a better term, and kind of said, said to my wife, like, I did not, God did not make me to be a hospice chaplain. Like, this was not what I thought this job was going to be. She had worked as a hospice chaplain, and I may have said something like, you're the hospice chaplain. I'm a chaplain for the living, not the dying. And she looked at me and she said, um, you know, this is a season. And eventually, eventually, you will not have anyone dying from a World Trade Center related illness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then she looked at me with like very sincere, you know, compassionate eyes and said, and it's your season, Anne. <laughs> so, uh, you know, as it's it's an incredibly sad experience. We have a we have a funeral this Saturday for the for the number two chief in EMS. I heard about that. Yes. And. Um, and, and what happens in a situation like that is everybody who works there is thinking, you know, that could have been me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He sounded like he was um, really highly respected, too. He was. He was really highly respected. And um, for me personally, it's especially hard. The, the chief of EMS um, and I are often mistaken for one another. <laughs> we, we have a whole comedy routine about it. You know, like people will come and try to confess things to her and she'll be like, whoa, 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 I'm the chief. You want <laughs> Anne, she's the chaplain. And, um, and often, like if I'm walking around in the city and, and somebody, you know, in, in an ambulance sees me, they'll think that I'm the chief and they'll like suddenly like, oh, get a little, you know, sit a little higher and straighter and act all like they're really on the up and up. And, um, and, and Chief Suriel, who, who passed away, he and, and and my my friend Lil were, were best best buddies, you know, wow. like wow. the concept of of your work husband, you know, like Chris Keenan, the Franciscan is is totally my work husband. And <laughs> and I've, I've like it's just really hard to think about somebody losing, you know, losing your best bro from work. Yes. It's, it's just gut wrenching. Sure you go through so much grieving, you know, in your job, right? I mean that's, right. that's that's hard. But you know, thank goodness there's people like you that are doing it. Well, and, and it isn't all sad either. You know, the, there's a there's a, an amazing benefit of being around tragedy kind of on the regular, which is, is that you tend to live life like, you know, <laughs> like you're matters. going 100 miles an hour. Yeah, you live <laughs> life like it matters. And um, I mean, I've never been around a group of people who are more than more than capable of of saying I love you. 
Mm. Uh, you know, I joke that like words are not our love language in the fire service. Like acts of service are are definitely, you know, often, often, you know, like, okay, it's kind of a full sentence. <laughs> but but I, I love you is just as much a or like, you know, I hope you're okay, or I'm checking in with you, um, is 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 a real gift of of getting to go and serve the people that I serve. And they're just a, a bunch of really fun people. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I'm sure, you know, it's got to be an amazing set of experiences. But uh, Plus, but I'll also let you in on a little secret. Like the first time I was ever driven around in a, in a vehicle with lights and sirens, like I've never experienced uh, like a rush of feeling so much power <laughs> as like watching, um, you know, watching cabs have to go and like get over on the way where, you know, somebody's, you know, driving. It's like, wow. You know, I could, all I thought about was like the bullies in third grade. I'm like, look at me now. <laughs> kind of a combination of a roller coaster and a tank or something like that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so anyway, let's get into the book. We're supposed to be talking about your new book. Um, <laughs> so well, about, I'll let you know a secret. Almost everything that I said is probably in the book. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, let's talk about how did this happen? How did this book happen? So um, this is like the most accidental book that I think could possibly be written. Uh, I just like, I like to write um, reflections and, and post them on Facebook, not with any brilliant intention, just like experiences of, of ministry. Some of my friends joke with me that like, you know, Angie, like you, you can see God anywhere in your, in your, in your daily life. And, and I'm like, oh, is that really what I'm doing? Um, but I tend to, I tend to be I don't know, lucky, I, I have an orientation of, of thinking theologically about what's going on. Um, somebody might say that I'm like really gifted with BS. Uh, I mean, per, perhaps that, that may also what be a great play. trait, <laughs> right? You know, it's, it's, it is, it is one of the, you know, one of the skills I think of, of, of ministry, like just being like, oh yeah, isn't that, that was interesting and notable. So I, I, I would, I would just write up, stories and observations from whatever was going on in, in, with my ministry. And, uh, and over the course of this time, a, a bunch of my friends started, you know, one or two, and then it got to be really annoying. We're like, oh, Anne, you should write a book. You should write a book. And I didn't want to write a book. I never thought that I could. I have an incredibly uh, minimal attention span. <laughs> so the idea of, of write, like, maybe I could have written, like, a devotional book of, like, you know, two paragraphs a day. Something really short, right? <laughs> something really short. Yeah, exactly. Like, and, and people would be like, but it's, it should be easy. You have all these Facebook posts. And I'm like, Facebook <laughs> yeah, posts easy, right? Just to do take not a, make a book, a right? Together in a Word document, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah, exactly. So then, and then, uh, you know, one of my friends conspired with a, with an editor who had helped her to write a book and said, oh, you should talk to my friend, Anne. And, and so one thing led to another, but um, in the actual, like getting it done, um, in the process, I think I've, I really figured out that I probably have dyslexia, which makes a lot of sense of my very creative spelling. Um, <laughs> I've very creative spelling. Um, but I realized how difficult it was for me to, um, to put kind of concepts in order, especially on a bigger level. And, um, and so I was, I was really lucky that, uh, one of our congregants had, had lost his job and like we were out for for brunch and he asked me how the book was and I was very like oh, I don't know I can't get this done I'm scared and he's like I want to help you write that book and so he and I figured out how to do this just by trial and error um he it was he had his work he's an airline executive and so he was he was got a interim job in in Europe so he would fly to Europe on Monday and fly back on Friday and uh, in between, while he was on the airline airplane, he would he would text me and weave together, you know, the 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 stuff that I was writing to send to him. And oh, uh, but without him, there would never have been a book. <laughs> so Marty St. George is is the is is the hero of of of, of be the brave one for sure. Um, and he was just incredibly generous with his ability and his his time. So. Um, also, like, really brilliant. He picked up, he, he I, there was one moment where he called me. He's like, you're going to love this section that I put together. And I'm like, what? He's like, 
I, it was re- I, I made a really, really funny joke just in your tone. It's really the perfect, like, I feel as though I fully made it as a ghostwriter. So, uh, so we really celebrated when, when he, he, he didn't just get the tone. He got the tone plus the ability to make, like, witty jokes. <laughs> yeah, which, which I would say, you know, when, when, when people have a theology of, like, uh, Jesus is my friend, Jesus comes alongside me and helps me. Uh, I mean, I often sometimes wonder, like, what, what, is that, what does that actually look like in, in real life? And, and I think it looks like having a friend who sees you, like, completely struggling. And, and I, I had foolishly made this promise. I had signed the contract to write the book. People are like, well, don't you know what was in your contract? I'm like, <laughs> not really. I just knew I had to return it to them, and I was probably late getting it back. And so I just signed it to get, you know, get them off my back. And then figured, like, oh, it's... It's not due for another six months, so I can put it off for a while and stop thinking about it, (laughs) which I will say is a very, uh, you know, puts me in good good standing with the fire department because it's either on fire or it's not a fire. You know, there's only two sets of time. So there's two sets of time writing a book, too. Like, it's either on fire or it's not on fire. So... (laughs) Well, and you had the pleasure of working with Lil Copan at Broadleaf Books, too, who, you know, I know very well, and she's a very highly respected editor. She's brilliant. And the thing that she was so brilliant at is is seeing potential in people who, like, I certainly didn't see the potential inside of me. So, and and I completely blew her off, especially in the beginning. Um, <laughs> thank you, Lil, for, for sticking with me. Um, but she's, I mean, she's sort of the publishing equivalent of like a really amazing, you know, major league baseball team scout mm-hmm. who goes around and, yeah. and, and, and finds the, the talent that nobody knows is there. Uh, so I, I just, I feel as a kid, I always dreamed of, of, of getting, you know, getting discovered by the Detroit Tigers, but instead I got discovered by Lil Copan and uh, now, you know, I'm on team Broadleaf. There you go. There you go. So, um, if I'm not mistaken, the book does not have an acknowledgement section, which is probably um, a little atypical, right? I mean, what's the story I'm with that? Trust you noticed that. Way to go! <laughs> so I'll I'll tell you what what is up with that was I didn't quite know when it was due. Number one, and number two, I realized if I started trying to acknowledge all of the people, which I could, I probably could have written something that would say that would have acknowledged what was going on. But I, that if I, like, this is so much of a team effort that I would, I was so afraid of leaving somebody out because there were so many people who have cheered me on and rooted me on that, um, that, that probably the braver thing would have been to say, I have so many people to acknowledge. And instead I just put it off and put it off and put it off because I didn't want to, you know, try to list them all. Um, but I also figured there would be other times to acknowledge all like, this is, I can't tell you how much of a team effort this was, Mm. um, Mm. like for everybody from like my, my, my clergy coach who, who worked with me. And, and in particular, I was like, I have to do these final edits. I hate final edits. I suck at editing. And she's like, they have a professional editor. (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, she's like, you're really good at making like utilizing a team, man why don't you just trust the editor? I was like, what I can concept. do that. Yeah. What a concept. So like, I just hit like, you know, select all and submit and it was good. Like it was great. And, uh, and I had a friend who um, I was really worried about accidentally um, saying something insensitive or, you know, rude or mean spirited or, and, and so I, I had a friend who was a sensitivity reader and it Excellent. was, and caught some really great catches. That's the um, whole idea, right? You know, it's the things that you're blind to, you know, somebody else. Right? And, and the, the other thing that, that I'm also like, I just, I woke up this morning. I'm a, I'm, in general, I'm a very anxious person. So I hope anyone can appreciate the irony of this title. It. <laughs> right? It's, it's all smoke and mirrors. It's all smoke and mirrors. <laughs> but the, the, the title is, is like, you know, really, really ironic because I, I, I I've been so blessed by people who have helped me to learn to be brave about writing this book. So this morning I woke up and I was like, oh no, who have I mentioned in the book? 
And do I need to, I need to make sure they get a, a complimentary like copy inscribed to them. And how am I going to go and find all the people? And then how am I going to get all of their addresses? <laughs> like, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, 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 so my neurotic fear of le- leading, leaving anyone out um, is, can easily keep me from doing things like having acknowledgments. <laughs> so, so who's the book for? You know, who, who, who do you recommend, you know, read this? Oh, that's a really brilliant question because it's kind of twofold. I mean, I think that if, if it's going to, if it's going to get to the people, so I, I hope that I wrote it for people who are like religion and faith is not necessarily for me, but I might be interested to see what it might look like in a, in a way that I haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. Um, but in order for those people to actually get to see the book, like it's going to have to, it's going to have to get enough publicity among probably the more traditional spiritual memoir readers um, before it, it kind of makes its way out to the general population. But I, I'm really hoping it's going to be people similar to the folks who are in our congregation who are surprised to be in church, who are surprised to be at all intrigued by, you know, by God, um, who are surprised to find themselves giving prayer a chance or, you know, connecting with spiritual values. Um, I really love people who are, or are more intrigued with people who are like you know, spiritually curious and, and not locked into a dogma. So, um, but I, I was super surprised this past weekend. I was um, asked to do a, a, a retreat for middle schoolers. So it was a bunch of Presbyterian churches who bring their middle school youth groups to a camp in New Jersey. And, and, and really it was a, it was a friend of me who suggested that I do this. Like, I mean, <laughs> would a friend throw you to the wolves of middle schoolers? <laughs> really? I'm not sure. Right. Really? And I went and, and so we designed this around storytelling and, 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 and talking about, you know, our story and God's story. And, and th- like the joke was on me because I didn't think middle schoolers were going to be into it. And instead, like they loved it. And I didn't ever think of myself as somebody who would really love connecting with middle schoolers. Like I've always just kind of been scared of them, like ever since I was in middle school Um, and it was great. So like if middle schoolers seem to like the book and they really did, I had a kid who like, I I was down to my last, I only brought one book because I only had one because I, my wife jokes that it was a little on brand that I just keep giving them away to people. Like, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, and, and the kids were like, you're just giving them away. And I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, we never, we didn't really do this to make money. We did this, you know, for God. So yeah. Well, so this one, one of the kids like chased down my, my, my son who's 13 and he was like, Hey, Hey, here's $12. It's all the cash I have. Can you go and get that copy of the book from your mom? I really need it. Oh my goodness. And I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe that this kid did. And and then I look over in the in the in, in the night like worship service, and there he is, like secretly reading the book. Oh my! And he wouldn't put it down, and I was like, "No way! Like I must be dreaming this." You've got a new fan base. I have a new fan base among the the the, the, the twelve to fifteen year olds. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, so you know, get the pastor that does the Dungeons and Dragons uh, youth group that you were telling me about. Get him to promote it to this group then you know right skyrocket it'll skyrocket you know (laughs) so i mean i don't know what your usual uh the authors that you that you interview their usual audience are i i hope that it's folks who who would be surprised to find themselves maybe even reading a book like i I find myself like wow i'm surprised i'm reading this um and sort of just surprised by by the ability to connect with the stories i think i think they're pretty universal in terms of of some of the themes there and and the characters are just wonderful folks like the kids at this youth group got me telling stories that are in the book and and it was the, i mean the characters just come alive <laughs> so because they are very alive you know the, the folks in green pointer totally so alive. what one thing would you hope that people who read it take away from the book oh good question 
I mean, I would say I would say that the real thesis is that if you can if you can take the time to name your own values and then work on trying to live them out, both in the success and the failure, that that you live a more fully alive life. And that living a fully alive life is like just means having adventures and meeting people and doing doing things that you'd never imagine doing. So I never imagined that that our little church would would grow and be a really active congregation. Uh, I, I never imagined that I'd really get to go and be the fire department chaplain. <laughs> and and I certainly wouldn't have imagined um, that they would actually want me. I mean, I think for the first several years of my time there, I was trying to sort of replicate the, the pre-existing, especially sort of Catholic chaplains. And, uh, and one day I, I asked a colleague of mine, like, for some guidance on something. And, and she's like, Anne, we didn't pick you because we needed another one of them. <laughs> you know, we picked you because we needed you in all your eccentricity and authenticity. Um, so like, don't try to be anybody other than yourself. Um, it's still a lesson that I'm, you know, practicing. But excellent advice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that, and that God picks you to be you, whoever that is. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. For sure. So since you enjoyed this writing experience so much, I mean, have you got any ideas for, you know, five more books that you're going to uh, come out with? <laughs> well, there was, there was, <laughs> there was a moment earlier in the year on Facebook where I, I asked people about um, what, what um, activity that they see that might be associated with some religious thing that might be called Christianity. Like what Christian practice, let's say, um, have you witnessed? Um, and would you be interested in knowing the theology behind it? Hmm. And so I, I just asked this as like an open-ended question because really like, especially for Protestantism, you know, it should all trace back to, to something in scripture and to our theology. And, um, and I got like, it was one of the most commented on posts There were probably a over a hundred different comments of like everything from, from, from why potlucks <laughs> to, <laughs> which was, I thought pretty great. Um, you know, why, why light candles at the beginning of services, why a red door on some churches. Um, so I, I immediately called up Marty and I was like, Hey Marty, I got this idea for a book. I think we should like, you know, do a hundred different, you know, weirdo things that we see Christians doing and, and try to plot their their theological beginnings. Anyway, I don't know if that's you know quite as uh, as as exciting as 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 it could be. But, oh, I uh, think there'll probably be a whole bunch of stories around that, right? That you can tell, right? I mean, the the the, the, the things that the, the the choices that people make, there's a reason why we make them. It's great. It's grounded in something. So. Whether it's um, rational or not, I mean, it comes from somewhere, right? Right, and 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 the, the practices that we do, yeah, it's it, it it's a bit of form following function and function following form. Mm -hmm. But I, I love thinking about those things in life. Yes, um, yes, good. So there could there could easily be a second book of similar adventures and misadventures. I'm I'm sure. Well, that's good um, to hear. I'm glad. Too. One of the one of the things that I was super excited about is. Um, uh, my friend Kevin Shea, who's a, a very well-known firefighter in the in the 90s, he made a very daring rope rescue that happened to be caught on video, and uh, and he he writes for Fire Engineering Magazine. Whoa, there we go. Whoa, right? Yep, Fire Engineering. It's like the People Magazine of the fire service. <laughs> and uh, so so Kevin is going to go and re review um, review the book for Fire Engineering Magazine, right? Right. And in the process, I was like, you need to meet Marty. Cause he's like, I don't know. I, I owe them another book, like a, a tactical guide to how to do like, like a very kind of an engineering book, right. It's what he's supposed to be writing. And I, I mentioned this to Marty and Marty's like, oh my gosh, I'd love to help him write that book. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> Marty's got a new side job, doesn't he? Marty's Marty's got a he's a, an incredibly gifted, gifted uh, writer and 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 with with a really interesting and brilliant theology. So well, was, when he retires from his day job, he's got a great second career, it sounds like. I, I yep, and you know, he's he's similar to you in that he um 
he really loves the church and uh, he was raised Catholic. And I think he probably would have easily been a, been a minister. Hmm. Um, so I, I think that he has a, a certainly has a, a calling and, um, and, and this is really, it's a calling to go and help people to write, write books mm-hmm. and to, to find their voice. And, um, and it was the most fun. Like, I can't believe I'm actually saying that now that we're done. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it wasn't, it wasn't so fun getting to the, you know, getting, getting, getting to this point, but now I feel it's like, right. It's, it's like a roller coaster, you know, well, now that you're through it, you know, you're past it, you can look back and let's say, do this yeah, again. I can do that. I mean, before you go through it, you never know. Right. I mean, right. Is this going to work or not? Is this going to happen or not? But, you know, once you're through it, that's, you know, it's great that you look on it positively. <laughs> well, and it's also like one of like, let's get in touch with some of your deeper insecurities. Like, I I mean, I'm dreading the idea of like reviews that people could post on Amazon. Like, what if they say horrible things? And, and in that case, like I've been, I've been really grateful of a group of friends of mine who have been my friend since fifth grade when we were all in fifth grade together and we have this group text going on that we've had throughout the pandemic and 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 they all got the book and we're like oh my gosh can you believe this is great this is great and I'm like guys I, I I'm just really afraid of when it you know when it comes out like what are people going to say and they were like just you know shut up and relax Ann. it's 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 good you know and don't uh, pay attention to any negative reviews. You know, that's never read the comments. Never read the comments. Authors should should know, you know. Just don't don't just ignore it. <laughs> so again, the book is Be the Brave One, Living Your Spiritual Values Out Loud and Other Life Lessons. There we go. See, look, I even came prepared. Yay. Yay. So it's available from Broadleaf Books and everywhere else where books can be found. Um, and thanks so much for uh, thank you with us to talk about this. It's really great to get to know you and I really wish you the best of luck on the launch of this. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. And thank you to your, uh, to your watchers and listeners who have participated in, in, in listening to our conversation. I I'm really sure appreciate they're going to enjoy it. So uh, I I'll, sure hope so. I'm sure they'll tell us, but in any event, thank you again. And uh, hope to hear back from you um, when the next book's ready. Thanks so much. I I appreciate your vote of confidence. (laughs) All right, Ann. Thank you. You got it. Thanks.